So I want to know what it, following the Islamic faith has done for your life personally. How, how has it helped you put yourself together? And also, I'm interested in, again, why you found the Islamic tradition preferable, let's say, to the Orthodox tradition that you did, you did enjoy the rituals that were part of that, at least. So let's deal with practical issues first. So, you, well, you just, I, yeah. Um, in terms of of uh, of why I chose Islam, I mean, I'm not completely convinced that I chose Islam. I mean, in some ways, Islam chose me as well. Um, so it's you know, guidance is a very strange thing for people. Like I saw an inevitability when I look back on what happened. I saw an inevitability. Uh, of of my uh, embracing Islam, I had some very interesting experiences that um, could be termed mystical or however uh, you want to determine them. But uh, the the tradition itself, what what struck me was one, I got to keep all of the prophets that I I believed in already, and I added in addition uh, what we consider to be the the final prophet, and just as very often Christians marvel at how Jews miss Jesus. Uh, Muslims also marvel at how Christians and Jews miss Muhammad. Although, to be fair to the Jews, they do acknowledge the prophet uh, as a providential force. And, and they do acknowledge him as a, a Noahidic messenger preparing the way for the, the coming of the Messiah. So they do recognize that he was a providential force, at least the great... Um, if you read George Kohler's book on Jewish theology, he has a chapter on Judaism and Islam. And certainly the great um, father of Orientalism, uh, Ignaz Golzeher, he actually said that he felt that Islam was the only religion that somebody of a philosophical bent could actually accept. And he wanted to, to, to really bring in the gift of philosophy into Judaism that had been uh, that the Muslims uh, had uh, so richly participated in. In fact, you know, there's an argument that just as Judaism prepared the way uh, for Christianity, it was Islam that prepared the way for uh, for a philosophical Western Christendom. Because if you look at the transmission of all of that knowledge that comes into Europe, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas, who's 13th century, he dies in 1274, and yet He's the doctor of the church. Just look at the number of times he quotes Muslims. I mean, he calls Averroes the commentator. So I think uh, Islam, you know, one of the beauties of the religion to me is that you'll find whatever you're looking for in it. I mean, Islam, you, you, it has a, a very simple theology that anybody can understand in Surah Al-Ikhlas, the, the chapter that says, say God is, is unique. Uh, God is completely independent. God neither gives birth nor was God born, and there's nothing like God. So it, it gives you a very simple uh, theology that anybody can understand, and yet embedded in that simplicity is an extraordinary complexity that actually created a metaphysical tradition that Western scholars have spent their lifetime studying, people like Henri Corbin or, or somebody. It's, it's like... Uh, Maxine Rodinson, uh, not Maxine Rodinson, but uh, uh, the great uh, Catholic uh, theologian and, and uh, metaphysician, Jacques Maritain, you know, recognize the genius of people like Al-Hallaj and things. So within the Islamic tradition, there's just an extraordinary spectrum. You can spend your entire life and have a satisfying life. And I know people that have done this, just mastering the recensions of the Quran and the Qira'at, the, the actual uh, uh, oral uh, expression of the Quran through the, the rules of Tajweed. Um, you, you can spend your life studying exegesis. You can spend your life studying prophetic tradition. You can spend your life studying the great mystics of Islam. We have the best poets in the world. We also have the best architecture. I mean, there's nothing like the Taj Mahal or the Alhambra Palace. And even Western architecture, if you read uh, Stealing from the Saracens, she shows how some of the finest Western architecture was basically taken from the Islamic civilization, including Notre Dame in, in Paris. So you can find incredible. I know people that just uh, came to Islam through music. I mean, I know some really uh, professional musicians that fell in love with 
Arabic music, which led them into uh, Muslim culture, uh, people that um, love just, I mean, one of the most interesting things about Islam is it is a truly universal religion in that you can go from Indonesia to California and find all of these different expressions of the same central truths of Islam with their own local colorings. So the West African Muslims are not like the Middle Eastern Muslims. The Middle Eastern Muslims are not like the Indian Muslims. And you have people like, uh, you know, one of the great um, impressionist painters of, uh, of uh, Sweden. I think he's actually considered a national treasure in, in Sweden, but uh, his, his paintings hang in the museum there. He became Muslim uh, in, in jail in, uh, in, um, for, for actually, he, he shot a, a matador because he was raised by his father was a veterinarian and he shot a matador um, because he was so horrified that they were bringing bullfighting into France. And there was such an uproar that they actually released him. Uh, but when he was in jail, he befriended an Algerian who uh, used to recite Quran all the time. And he ended up becoming Muslim and, uh, and then studying in Egypt and then going back to, uh, to his uh, native land. He died in Spain, uh, but extraordinary individual. So you have people like that. You have people that Anybody can find what they're looking for. And, and that is the power of the faith, I think, is that it is truly a universal faith. And I think one of the things that Western people tend to do, one, they don't recognize that it's a Western faith because it is. It's part of the Abrahamic faith. Uh, it, it was in Spain for centuries. It's been in Eastern Europe for centuries. Um, and even Istanbul, which is the great capital of Islam for centuries, is half in Europe and half in, 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 in the East. And that's why it really bridges these two worlds. And so there's so much. I mean, well, why did part all of the reason why I think it makes sense for religious people, Christians, Jews and Islamic alike to focus on their commonalities in the face of the things that are disintegrating our cultures we could start by trying to make some peace between us if we're going to consort ourselves reasonably as religious individuals. Right. And I commend you for trying to, to do some bridge building because, uh, you know, arguably um, there, there's been so much negativity around this faith and around its adherence that there's an almost instantaneous um, association with the most negative aspects of humanity with the religion and, and it's, it's quite tragic. And so just as an exercise, a kind of bracketing for a second and try to, try to think about things, uh, a, a mentor of mine and a friend of mine, Dr. Thomas Cleary wrote a book called Zen Koans. He also translated the Quran. He's one of the brilliant translators of, the, of, uh, of our lifetime. But he wrote a book called Zen Koans. And in the introduction of that book, he actually says that the purpose of a koan is to snap people out of, of, of sloppy thinking. I think I read thinking. that book, yeah. But he says in there, but you don't need a koan to do that. Just ask an educated Western person what they think about Islam, and they'll start expressing all of these prejudices. And if you ask them, have you ever read the Quran? No. Do you know anything about the Prophet Muhammad? No. Uh, other than maybe something they read in a, uh, a newspaper article or in Time or Newsweek or the Atlantic Monthly. Something yeah, like well, it's that. not it's not an easy thing to try to get a toehold in a different tradition, especially it's when not you that don't hard. even have a toehold in your own. Yeah, I, I, it's not that hard, especially for an educated person. You're, you're obviously a highly educated person. It's not that hard. Islam. One of the things Gibbon said is that Islam spread because it's it was a very easy religion to understand. So this idea that I can't understand it, I can't, I'm having a hard time. It's not that hard to understand. I mean, Islam well, is actually a very straightforward. Okay, then give me a give me a five minute summary of the core beliefs. I, I don't want to put you on the spot. I, I, it's not a question. No, no, that's not, not. That's not hard at all. The, so, the, so lay lay it out. That would be very so, helpful. So we have a famous hadith in which uh, we're we're told that the. The angel Gabriel came in the form of a man and asked the prophet, tell me about faith. And, and the prophet Muhammad said, faith is to believe that there's only one God 
and that Muhammad, which includes all the previous messengers, is a messenger of God, to believe in angels, to believe in the books that God has revealed, to believe in the last day, the day of judgment, and to believe in the uh, measuring out of good and evil, that good and evil is part of life. And then he said, tell me about Islam. And he said, Islam is that you uh, make the testimony of faith, that you pray five times a day, that you fast Ramadan, that you pay zakat, uh, the 2.5% of your standing wealth at the end, not your income tax, but your standing wealth at the end of a year, that's a whole year, 2.140th is given to poor people. There's eight categories that are given in the Quran. And that you, if you're able to, you make a pilgrimage once in your lifetime to Mecca. And then he said, tell me about Ihsan, uh, which is the third dimension of Islam. And he said, and this is the dimension of virtuous being, like being a person of arity, of excellence in the world. And he said, Ihsan is to worship God as if you see God. And if, you, and if you don't see him, at least you know that he sees you. So you have an awareness uh, of that, 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 you're, that there is a, a divine presence and you should be in a state of awareness in your behavior. I mean, one of the things about, you know, if you're driving and everybody's speeding and then somebody sees a cop, they all suddenly slow down. You know, I have a friend once who just zoomed past the cop when everybody slowed down and he pulled him over. And he said, why didn't you slow down? He said, I felt like a hypocrite. <laughs> so the guy gave, he let him go. But, you know, that's people when they're in the presence of authority, they tend to behave well, unless they're an utter rebel. I mean, there are those people. I'm trying to figure out how to be a Jew and a Christian and a Muslim at the same time. But become Muslim. That's the best way, because... The beauty of Islam is you get the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Last Testament. I mean, that really is, for me, even the Jews acknowledge this, because Islam, in many ways, is a universalized Judaism. It's Judaism for the Gentiles. Uh, we, we have the mikvah, you know, they do ghusl, we have ghusl, I mean, you know, which is the ritual, uh, the, the baptism, a total immersion in water ritually to, to purify yourself, which is done at least once a week. 